which we have in the Kishwaukee and the Nippersink. So we have um, a speaker from U of I, a chemist down there, John Scott, who um, it was partnered with us in doing the microplastic study. He's been running samples from here, which we've collected thanks to Cindy Skrugrud and Scott Kuykendall. We've gone out on those two rivers a number of times, um, so we've got some really interesting data, and he'll be here in person, hopefully, fingers crossed, um, and we'll be sharing information about that data and about the microplastic situation in our watershed here in McHenry County. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Is that the what first of September? Wednesday the first? I think that's it from me. So as part of our program this evening, please remember if you're on Zoom to keep your, um, your microphone muted. And if you would turn off the camera because we do record it. And uh, then we'll focus on the PowerPoint presentation that Vince has for us. And you're in for a real treat here this evening. So Nancy Williamson was able to put this together for us and we'll introduce our speaker tonight. Nancy, are you there? I'm here. I have no idea what it looks like down here. It looks strange. Okay, <laughs> it's, in, it's in black and white. I haven't yeah. seen you in a long time. I know. Well, I'm here. Wait. Oh, there I am in the camera. Hi, guys. Um, yeah, I, I'm really excited to have Vince Mosca. He um, sent me a very, very short bio. He's extremely modest, but he is a big mucky muck in Hay and Associates. And he has spent years as an ecologist, and I believe he's probably a senior ecologist right now, with Hay and Associates, involved in thousands of pro projects. He's very much focused now on restoration and water quality projects, and he's the go-to guy when you want to fix things. Um, he's also, luckily, on our Friends of Hackmatack National Wildlife Refuge Board, and we're very grateful to have him. And he just started doing this Monarchs and Margarita thing, and we just let him go. He's done it. <laughs> all over the place. He's done it at Starved Rock for a bunch of, what were they, junior high science teachers? College, and community college. college junior college yeah. high science teachers. He's done it in numerous places. It's wildly popular, and we're very excited to have him do this for our first um, kind of hybrid in person. Um, as it says in our little, you know, kind of blurb about this, uh, critical pollinators, the Mount Monarchs have crashed. We've lost 90% of them from habitat loss, agricultural practices, and climate factors. And so he's gonna discuss the plight of the monarch, the incredible journey of the monarch, and many of the things that maybe we can do, along with its link with uh, tequila producing in the region of Mexico. So Vince, take it away. All right. Thank you. Nobody's really coming here to listen to me. They just want to talk about monarchs and tequila, but that's okay. I've gotten used to that. So, um, good evening, everybody. Yeah, I've enjoyed my relationship with Hackmatack uh, National Wildlife Refuge. I wasn't really involved in the beginning. Um, There's a lot of good work that was done by many of the people that you guys know. But when it was starting to form, I was able to be involved in that, and then I joined the board several years later. So, um, and this program sort of came out of nowhere, if you will, and it has become very popular, and it's a fun program to give for me, because it's an interesting sort of mix of nature and culture and some other things, and then, so since it's my program, I can throw in anything I want, so we've got Lake Erie's in here and all kind of stuff, so um, I'll go through it. Um, very open to questions or comments along the way as necessary, and, but I'll, I'll go through it. I'll probably skip some of the slides, because some of you guys probably don't need to hear some of that but we'll go ahead the highlights and then we'll go from there. So, all right. So I had to put a Duke slide in. Yay. So, Yay. Thank you. 
So there's a taskbar. Yes, of course. There's a taskbar top. Sorry about that. It says coincidence. So Duke's logo on the left, the chlorophyll molecule. Many of you know. So, but, and I've always been fascinated by this, is that the chlorophyll molecule, magnesium is in the center, and then the hemoglobin, that makes life for mammals and other things possible, are essentially the same molecule, except for the central molecule, iron versus magnesium. So when you look at the chemistry of that, there's just, it's too coincidental to not be a coincidence. <laughs> so when you think about that chlorophyll makes life on this planet possible, and then perhaps evolution or natural selection and things have changed through the years, but that the chemistry of those two molecules are just strikingly similar, but only difference is magnesium versus iron. So I thought that was kind of cool, and obviously it's a highlight from Dukes. All right, so monarch butterflies, everyone sort of knows the monarch, but you know it's a very interesting life cycle, you know, many insects have this complete metamorphosis, but the monarch in particular, we sort of all know it, you know, it goes from the egg on the underside of the milkweed leaf to the caterpillar that we all like, the black and yellow and, and white, to the chrysalis to the adult, you know, completely different, you know, metamorphosis, and they look completely different at each, at, at every step, which is just a, an amazing thing. So, the classic caterpillars, the caterpillars or their kids only eat off the milkweed plant, which most of us know. Why they do, there's probably some uh, uh, natural selection issues. The, the bitter latex, the, the milk, is probably not necessary for the life of the monarch, but it makes them taste bad. So they've evolved to be able to tolerate the bitterness, which might make other insects sick, but they can tolerate it and then it makes them not taste good so that things don't eat that. So it's not that they need the milk per se, but they, they are benefited by eating it. And probably even the chemistry, you know, isn't a perfect sort of thing for them. Okay. So the chrysalis caterpillar gets to go through several instars, makes that classic J, and then turns into the chrysalis, becomes a, a goo, you know, literally just dissolves into a goo and then a couple weeks later emerges as the, the adult. So that you know egg, caterpillar, chrysalis, goo step, and then it, it becomes and if you've ever watched it on your counter, which many of us have, it is just an amazing thing to go from that beautiful green chartreuse to the you know the clear and then emerges the adult. You know, it's just a, just an amazing kind of thing to watch. So the adults Male and female, there's a, you know, the male has a, a couple dots that the female does not. You can tell the differences on the wing, potentially. And then there's the viceroy that mimics the monarch. This it doesn't have, so the viceroy has a, a, a different wing pattern. Mm -hmm. My time's up already. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Jesus. All right, so, all right, I have to, uh, I have editorial a little bit. So, Monarch butterfly has been around for obviously a long time, but it wasn't until the 1970s that American scientists figured out where they went. So part of my metamorphosis in this program is that I gave the program and after a couple times I thought, well, if they go to the same place in Mexico every year, I would think that the Mexicans would know where the butterflies are, right? But it took until 1975 when I was in grade school for the American scientists do tagging to figure out where they went to Mexico. And so that's part of the whole story here, including the shirt. Um, so, but the, the North American scientists outside of Mexico really didn't know where they went until they started tracking them. So, which is pretty interesting. And the fact that the monarch migrates, because insects just don't migrate, right? You don't, honeybees don't migrate, wasps, hornets, moths, you know, all the other butterflies, nobody migrates but the monarch essentially, which is part of their, their story and part of their problems. But so this magnificent um, trip, North American, all east of the Rocky Mountains, all of our butterflies, except for a little baby population in Florida, all go to the same essentially neighborhood in Mexico. So you think, so Crystal Lake butterflies go to Mexico, but so do the ones from Ontario go to Mexico, or Cape May, New Jersey 
go to Mexico. So you think about that journey that they have to go through, and they all go to that same spot. So, so it's now August. So the this generation, or maybe the next one around here, but Canadian super generation monarch is the one that actually makes the trip. So a June monarch around here probably lives six weeks, eight weeks, or something like that. This generation that goes all the way to Mexico will live six or seven months. So it's a special genetics that make it ready for the trip to Mexico. So which is very different. So multiple generations on the way back from Mexico, but one generation down makes their first trip, has sex, and then dies, <laughs> and then their kids come back at home. So we won't go too much into that. So um, I don't think I have the right license for that. But um, and they use you know the magnetic field and the orientation of the sun or whatever. But it's a winter vacation, so there's these colonies of the butterflies that loosely in this neighborhood, relatively small spot in central Mexico, where they all go. And it's all it's a communally owned cooperative by the local farmers that own the land to help protect it. And one of the biggest threats down there, besides weather, is illegal logging because there's not a lot of money in that region, and so they have to protect the, the trees for the monarchs to be able to hang out in over the winter. So you can see the the orange. You might recognize the orange of the butterfly, and then you can see where the logging is taking place really close to there. So these forests are very important to protect because if those trees weren't there, the butterflies would not be able to do what they do every winter. And this is actually a picture of frosted monarchs, one that's not frosted. They go down, and it's the Oyamel fir tree. Um, also known as the, you know, the, it's a religious kind of thing because of it. it's, it's known as sacred fir, partially because of its special connection with the butterfly. Up high altitude, you know, 6,000 to 13,000 feet up in the mountains. And then it's cool, um, cool dry winters up there in the summer, in, in the wintertime where they, where they hang out. So, uh, but this is the sort of the crux of the whole story is that over time, so on the left side of the graph is the mid 90s. And you can see that the population, so the, you know, you don't need to read the numbers, but the longer the graph, but the bar, the more butterflies there are. They don't count individual butterflies because there's hundreds of millions of them potentially, but they count the area that they occupy. So those numbers at the top of the bars are how many hectares, which is like 2.2 acres or something like that. I should know my, met my um, metrics, but um, so you can see that you know, overall, so the population is large in the mid 90s and have steadily declined. And so this past winter, you can see that we had a good winter a couple years ago, but then these last two winters, they're you know, declining, not as low as they've been, but still pretty low. Something like 30 million butterflies they've estimated, but the area that they occupy is less than the land that I own on my farm. I only have 12 acres, but do you think that's 2.18 hectares of land of these different loose colonies that they, they measure. So all of our butterflies all go to the same spot and then go all, essentially all to the same spot. And that's part of their problem because they are so susceptible to any kind of problems you might have in that, in that neighborhood for the winter time because they're essentially on top of each other. So population decline, this line here is considered kind of the, maybe the extinction threshold. Mm -hmm. So that even though we have millions and millions of monarch butterflies, at some point in the future, there might just not be enough of them to find each other. Mm -hmm. So that's why a lot of the scientists are worried because there's a lot of reasons why they're declining. But then even though we have a lot of them, um, the numbers are continuing to decline at some point. So Fish and Wildlife Service has considered adding them to the endangered species list, mm -hmm. and they were probably warranted that their numbers are down far enough that they probably deserve to be on the list, but there's too many other species in front of it to get added in, oh. which is not necessarily a good answer, but at the same time, that's where they're at. And hmm. monarchs are habitat generalists, so they nectar all over the place. So when you think about it from a regulatory standpoint, how do you how do you regulate 
monarch mo butterfly habitat when every time you plant a pollinator garden on your property, that becomes endangered species habitat. Mm -hmm. So are you allowed to mow? You know, prescribe fire? I mean, all these kind of things that we do on our pollinator habitat could be technically listed species habitat, which would complicate things. So they've got fancier Recording stuff. Recording in progress. Thank you. <laughs> fancier stuff in front of it to be listed. So they still have protection at a certain level, but it's more voluntary protection than it is regulatory in the classic sense of the rusty patch bumblebee or the bald eagle in the old days and you know, those kind of things. It just hit enter. Oh, I got it. Got it. Got it. And the host hit, um, got it maybe? Oh, there's the, there's the, yeah, maybe there's the, there's the, there's the, there's the. It's recording now. <laughs> yeah, can you hit got it? Or, um, where's got it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't think you're seeing, I don't, right, right in the middle of our screen. I, I don't think you're seeing what I'm seeing. So, um, I should probably stop sharing for a second. <laughs> Uh, intermission. <laughs> questions. That's fun. Yeah. I get paid by the questions. So, <laughs> so Vince, just real while we're doing yeah. this, why would there be a what, if, if, what is the waiting list and why would a waiting list keep you from getting on? I mean, is this because there's something? I think it's staff bandwidth. It's capacity Basic, to, yes, to do I all think, the things they need to do. Yeah. Okay. So they've done population studies. Yeah. The numbers aren't good. You know, they're over 90% now. But in the end, there's 33 million of them. And so when you start looking at regulating them, there's other things that are on the list that are probably more super endangered, and they just essentially don't have the capacity to get them on, it's my understanding, from, from the Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Sorry, I don't know why it's not letting me know that screen. Oh, I don't know when it went over here. And you can't use it. <laughs> Yeah, but can I be a co-host instead of the host? Any other questions? No, I don't think so. Comments? Yes, yes, sir. We're getting up 33 million because of the number of acres. And you're on there. site. That's what you're they the have estimated, kind of uh, gross numbers, yes. So even though they don't, when they're counting them, I think believe from the air, they're not counting individuals, but when they extrapolate of the spots that they find, then they have a, oh, some good. kind of formula so, that they use. To get and so the like 33 million are supposedly yeah, going back it. north, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. We can't they have the potential to go back north if they survive. So so not all of them survive. And they're going east or west or south. All north and east. So this is acting not as a duplicate screen, but as a second screen. Okay. So I have to... Go all the way. There we go. Oh, I remember this from last month. <laughs> 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 I still know how to get rid of that bar at the top, but hopefully. Uh, yes, go ahead. There's, there's several different kinds of milkweeds. Is it the common milkweed that they like the best, or does it matter? Um, oftentimes, like, people say that the swamp uh, milkweed is maybe their favorite. Yeah. It's a little bit smaller, gentler leaf. I mean, as far as thickness goes. Oh, there we go. So probably swamp around here, common butterfly weed. Yeah. Now we're getting the uh, Sullivan's is a little bit more rare, but. Oh, Swamp's okay. really good for it, and the younger nope. common milk. No, you're not. Okay. They don't like this the older one, view. the leather, leathery mm -hmm. one. We see his next slide. That starts with That's good, yeah. right? No, it was doing presenter view instead of slide. Oh. Yeah. It's still doing presenter view on the recording. <laughs> oh, here, hang on. Just play settings. There you go. Is that better? Anyone raising monarchs on their uh, counter right now? Those are mine. Right I see those. Awesome. <laughs> nope, it's not. Um, is there any poop in there that we can hold? Uh, yeah. Grass in there? Yeah, uh, there is, yeah. There. Now it is. Now it is. Now it is. Now it's not good for us.
anyone's ever raised I think you guys have to live with yeah. it. The no, no, yeah, yes. the tomato hornworm. Okay. If anyone okay. ever tried to grow those, okay. I've grown those on my counter. Oh, oh. You can actually hear them eating. The thing that they can hear me like many wildlife species, lots of different threats out there. Breeding habitat, lots of threats up here, breeding habitat, as opposed to the overwintering habitat in Mexico. Climate change, big factor, especially the weather patterns as it relates to it, and then the effect of climate change on things like parasites and pine bark beetles and other things that might harm the trees. Agriculture, chemicals, several kinds, natural predators, they do get eaten by certain things. And then their lifestyle, it's that the migration part of their lifestyle and you know, specifically laying their eggs only on the milkweed, so they have to be able to find the milkweeds. The adults nectar on a lot of things, but so there's things about the monarch, although they're super common, sort of, um, that you know cause problems with their threats and then with endangerment. So very vulnerable especially in their overwintering habitat because they're all in one spot. You get a bad storm in a neighborhood and you can lose, you know, there's stories, you know, of major losses. And then you compound the habitat losses, agriculture, you know, we've all heard that when ethanol became hip and, you know, all of a sudden corn prices went up, so hedgerows went away and all that stuff. So even modern agriculture with the chemicals, but it's also the practices because the habitat's less now. So even those little scraggly fields that we used to have 20, 30 years ago would have monarch habitat in them have been removed because corn prices went up. And yeah, over 90% down on a 20 year average. So there's a story on that, you know, off the internet, 500 million butter butterflies were killed in a weekend because of one storm. So, you know, and you think about that. So 2002, so the numbers were already on the decline and you lost you know, essentially half of the population in one winter. So you're starting at a deficit for that next spring because the, the adults can only have so many kids. So if you're starting, you know, starting out, and that was uh, estimated 14 times the current population. That's how many just died, you know, as adults in Mexico. So, and that's a, that super generation, you know, because they're, they're, they're long lives, so they make it all the way down and they have to make it essentially back to northern Mexico or Texas to breed for the next generation to come north. And they've got those little scales on their wings, and so you get beat up and you know, all that stuff. So there's a lot of things that can happen on that. So, and then current conditions, so our butterfly is gonna be heading south soon and heading into a drought. Pretty severe drought. So you think about, you know, so they need, they need nectar and water on the way down. So they're gonna be going maybe Good habitat up here, but then all the way down, they might, you know, hit dust eventually. So climate change certainly, and then there's that minimum viable population. It's kind of like, it's not a great analogy, but the passenger pigeon. None of us were alive to, to see that, but it went extinct in the late 1800s, early 1900s. There were a billion of them at one time, but we effectively killed enough of them that the population numbers were so low they couldn't find each other to have a, an effective breeding population and went extinct. So even though they went extinct probably because of hunting, the monarch won't be ex potentially go extinct from that, but it's the same kind of idea is that the numbers are just so low that there's just not enough of them to make new ones. So, and also, um, they do not hibernate in Mexico. They stay alive all winter, just like a honeybee. Honeybees do not hibernate. They eat honey all winter. That's why they make it. We steal some of it from them. Um, but so they actually have to have some water. So if there's a drought in Mexico, they don't have enough nutrition potentially to, to thrive through the winter for that current trip. And the winter time is the driest part the time of the, in the, the mountains in Mexico. So there's a, even less water. So you can see all those, the puddling and you have a butterfly garden at home, you have wet stones or sand. Butterflies are really attracted to that. And so are the monarchs in Mexico. But you can see that the average precipitation in the wintertime is at the lowest. 
there's a lot of factors, unfortunately. So, and then we get to sort of the modern world of genetically modified crops, mm -hmm. Roundup Ready beans, Roundup Ready corn. Um, there's the BT corn that has a genetically modified to have a um, essentially a chemical that kills the corn borer moth, moth, butterflies, very related. So there's discussion then, so not only do you have the glyphosate, which then Roundup, which kills milkweeds if they're in the field, which they wouldn't necessarily have been killed under previous farming practices, but then also you now have the BT corn, which actually has genetically modified to actually produce a chemical that kills the moth that mm. was a big predator on corn, which is great because then you don't have to spray to kill the, the moth. But now you have corn pollen that could have be genetically modified that actually has problems for. So corn is wind pollinated, so the butterflies don't care about corn, but corn pollen flies, lands on a milkweed plant, caterpillar eats it, mm. makes them sick. There's a lot of discussion whether it actually kills the butter, uh, the caterpillar, but it's not good for them. I'll say that. So mm -hmm. there's these, you know, multiple levels, and then the crop prices, and then that refugia. So the hedgerows in the old days, where you had scattered weeds of, you know, New England aster and milkweeds and all that kind of stuff. A lot of those things have been removed and just aren't there for monarchs and a whole bunch of other insects, mammals, snakes, those kinds. And then modern more, these neonicotinoids, which are systemic chemicals that you could buy a plant that has actually been treated with the chemical so that it's actually in the plant, not on the plant. So you buy a plant at Home Depot, bring it home, has a flower on it, monarch butterfly comes, could get a chemical in it from the flower, which you actually kill it. So there's a lot of worldwide discussion about the neonicotinoids, whether they should be banned because they are, they're great chemicals if you're from the farm side, but mm. on the mother nature side, it's, they're probably a risk factor for a lot of things. Spraying for gypsy moths and mosquitoes, depending on what you're spraying, certainly could kill anything in there, and then the BT corn and, you know, the new thing. So, get to tequila. <laughs> so, very interesting, and I did not know this before I did my first program. Um, so it is kind of a perfect partner for the monarch because it's well known and it's also a regional thing that a tequila is. Uh, opportunities for ecotourism, both the tequila and the monarch. And this connection between human culture and mother nature is really kind of interesting. It's an ancient kind of thing that, um, that the, in central Mexico there. So the little star oh, is the biosphere reserve where the monarch's over over winter, and then these are the tequila producing regions of, um, of Mexico. So realistically, full disclosure, the monarchs and the agave don't really interact, <laughs> but they sort of do because of the overlap in the, in the neighborhood and where they, and the, and the cultural aspects that go, that go with it, so. But it's still a good hook. <laughs> so, something I also didn't know that uh, tequila can only be made in, in that part of Mexico. So you can't make tequila in Texas or Kentucky, similar to a champagne. There's only a few states that they actually make tequila in. And then all the tequilas are, are mezcals, but not all mezcals are tequila. So those of you, if you remember your college days with the worm at the bottom of the bottle, <laughs> we've all done it. Yeah. So the mezcal, you, for tequila, you can only use the blue agave plant, whereas the mezcal, you can use various species of the agave. So it's pretty pretty interesting. When it, so it's kind of like a, you know specialty whiskeys that they only use you know certain uh, ingredients from certain parts of the world, highland, lowland, those kinds of things. So for tequila, it has to only be the blue agave type. So it is a pre-Columbian technology. So in the 1500s, tequila started in, in that part of Mexico, and it's become a UNESCO, it's a World Heritage Site, the agave landscape, and ancient industrial facilities of tequila. So it's pretty interesting. So you know, back well before the Europeans came to that part of the world, 
the, the natives were making making tequila at that time on these you know volcanic soils you can see it's kind of an interesting you know it's a big ball basically where they use some interesting little tools to actually cut off the, the spiky things to make to take that to the distillery so there's the plant in full bloom you can see kind of the landscape pollinated by bats thought it'd be kind of cool if it was pollinated by monarchs but it wasn't so um, but they also they process about 300 million plants a year to make tequila so that's a lot of a lot of tequila a lot of plants and so now you can see the the, the bat in the middle picture there that's pollen all over its face so it's pretty interesting and for you whole foods hippies out there the the, the sugar that's in the agave the blue agave is what they sell in the bottle as a sugar substitute. Mm -hmm. So that sugar is what makes the alcohol, which makes the tequila. Mm -hmm. So when you see that at the store, that potentially could become tequila at your own house. So, <laughs> all right, I'm a, as I like to say, I'm a blue collar kid from Pittsburgh, so I'm not overly cultured per se. And I had this revelation of, you know, if we have the monarchs half the time and the Mexican folks have it the other half of the time, I wonder what they think about the monarch. Mm -hmm. And so I literally typed into an internet browser, Mexican culture and monarchs, mm -hmm. and found out some very interesting things, which I it's been sort of um, transformative is a big word, but it's really kind of an interesting connection. And that when the monarch butterflies head to Mexico and eventually get there, end of October, and the day of the dead. And so the Mexican culture, the, the harvester butterfly, because they're harvesting corn at that time, very important for Mexican culture, um, but then it also overlaps with the Day of the Dead, and so there's a lot of Mexican culture that's related to um, the monarch butterfly and the Day of the Dead. Yeah. But then also, in the traditional belief that it was the, you know, the souls of their ancestors um, returning for a visit, and then as they move forward, Mexico became very Christian, very Catholic over time. And so all of a sudden, the, you know, all hell is Eve, all saints day and all that stuff. So now all of a sudden, the Catholic traditions that they were, I, I, I think I may have doubled up on the souls, but the, it went from the ancestors coming home to visit to the souls of the ancestors coming home to visit. So you'll be able to find on the internet a lot of celebrations as it, as it relates and then the artwork that goes with that. That because it overlaps with that time of year, it's very predictable. I don't think it's a day-to-day -day thing, but it's always that time of the year where they go back to that part of Mexico and it, uh, the locals are expected there. So there's a lot of Mexican artwork that's related to the monarch, which I think is really, really cool and you know, descriptive of what's going on. So there's a lot of Mexican things. A lot of different approaches. There's you know the individual yard to plant your pollinator garden community level, forest preserves, conservation district lands, better agricultural practices, and then the big right of ways, kind of the state, interstate corridors and the electrical corridors and things like that, where you can do a lot of good for the monarchs. A lot of partnerships involved um, in the monarch. Uh, the, during the Obama administration, when the numbers started going down in Mexico and the United States, Canada, all talked. There's been a lot of initiative, a lot of money put into um, monarch education and then also milkweed, uh, basically giving away milkweed and milkweed seeds to anyone who wanted it, which I think is pretty interesting. A lot of different pollinators out there. You guys are probably pretty enlightened on these kinds of things, but you know, there's a lot. Monarchs are sort of maybe overemphasized as super pollinators, but there's a whole bunch, you know, thousands of different things that are out there, you know, hummingbirds and beetles and hornets and wasps. Lots of things that, that pollinate uh, and do good things for us. There's a pollinator week every week, uh, every, every, every year, um, back in June. Um, but it's pretty interesting. Pollinators, you know, everyone sort of knew the name pollinator in the old days, but now it's become pretty chic and everyone's got signs in their yard and these days. And I, I think that's pretty cool because you can get a lot of things. New trend in these kind of little insect hotels, so that you build different things that basically give spaces for insects to find places to live. So you can stick broken bricks and bamboo sticks and all kind of interesting lotus blossoms and all kind of things in there 
to, and it's a nice kid project to put in the backyard to attract native bees and some of the solitary bees and things like that that might be in there. So great projects. So a lot of resources on the internet for a lot of the, those kinds of things. And then one thing I like about the monarch, if you will, or the idea of pollinators is that you don't have to talk about carbon sequestration and climate change, you just talk about pollinator habitat. If you get the carbon sequestration, you just don't tell anybody about it. <laughs> so I like to say like, you know, even like a Mitch McConnell, you can say, well, look, we're planting monarch habitat. He would probably even like that. You just don't tell him about climate change. <laughs> good stuff, and then we're all, we're all better for it, right? And there's a lot of science that's out there. The Xerxes Society sells that pollinator habitat sign. I just bought one for our place. And then at Monarch Way Station, there's a lot of highway departments and things that are using those signs and pretty descriptive of all that's going on. So local perspectives. Um, one thing that's interesting, so my career has been in private side consulting work and the stormwater management ordinances over time have all matured that they all require native vegetation. So when we look at stormwater detention basins and crane gardens and bioswales, they're all native vegetation to a large degree. So it's easy to work in things like green infrastructure in modern projects because they have to. So, you know, 25 years ago, what, that wasn't the case. So there's a lot of regulatory things that have now caught up with it. And native landscaping is now hip. I mean, it's everywhere these days. So um, it's not something that's, uh, you know, a fringe kind of activity like it might have been in the past. So lots of different things that can be done. We can skip some of this for tonight. But um, I don't know if anyone's ever been to Point Pelee in Canada. So it's an interesting thing, an interesting phenomenon. Lake Erie, uh, was this Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York. There's this little point that sticks down into the lake and it's the last southernmost place where the monarch butterflies from that part of Canada come down before they have to fly across the lake. So you go there in the fall, and you can see 25,000 monarch butterflies that are all coming down to that point, plus hawks and songbirds and a whole bunch of stuff. So it's really very interesting place to go visit to see that, that, that geographic phenomenon of that point, because the animals, as they track down the shoreline, they kind of are just all naturally tunneled there. So it's a Canadian National Park and you can um, go there and see you know, that fall migration, which is pretty interesting. Not as much on the springtime, because they're not channeled the same way, but definitely a fall phenomenon. And there's a nice place up in Escanaba area. It's a similar kind of thing that the, the birds and the monarchs are following the uh, Lake Michigan shoreline and get concentrated. Cape May, New Jersey mm -hmm. is another one that you guys may, may be familiar with. Hackmatech, I assume that most of you know what Hackmatech is or where Hackmatech is, and if you don't, please step to the back. We're going to have a, a uh, what do they call it, an intervention <laughs> to make sure that you leave here knowing what Hackmatech is. So, all right, so we're in Crystal Lake, which is you know down here somewhere. So it's that loose band of uh, natural areas centered roughly on Glacial Park initially, that big holdings, that wonderful holdings of the Kendrick County Conservation District. Goes up into Wisconsin, and so it's, uh, and fitted on, mostly on the Nipperson Creek watershed. So, a lot of the goals are related to um, producing good habitat for grassland birds. And then also for the human uses that, you know, National Wildlife Refuges can be hunting free or not hunting free, depending on how they're all set up. And Hackmatech is definitely open for hunting, fishing, wildlife observation, a lot of human uses for, for our refuge itself because of where it's at. And then promoting science and, and citizen, citizen science kind of projects as it relates to stewardship and tree plantings and things. You may recognize Dave and Ed and, and others there. So. Um, there's some folklore about the federal government trying to take people's land to make national wildlife refuges, jackbooted thugs kind of philosophy. <laughs> philosophy. There's only willing sellers to go into Hack and Tech, so they have to be families, individuals that want to sell their land or grant an easement. There's no taking of anybody's land in this part of the country as it relates to Hack and Tech. So there's some Kankakee 
was trying to get a national wildlife refuge off the ground, and there's a lot of local uh, <coughs> opposition to it by the, the local communities and, and farmers down there. So, yeah, and protecting all these, you know, these linking the corridors and, uh, along the Nipper Sink is, you know, just super, super important. There's hack to tack with the state line between Wisconsin and uh, in Illinois. One of the things about hack to tack when it was was uh, first formed was that it was a urban wildlife refuge. You may not consider Hebron urban, <laughs> but at the federal level, it's not Montana, and uh, there's 12 million people within an hour and a half. So between Milwaukee, Rockford, Chicago land, <coughs> Northwest Indiana, it's there's a lot of people that can get to hack to tack in a fairly short amount of time. So that was very attractive to, to the Fish and Wildlife Service. And it does fit into the Chicago Wilderness Green Infrastructure Plan for obvious reasons. Uh, yep, um, one of the things then, the, there's the value of the land itself, but then the value to the Fox River and the Nipissing Creek by protecting the land and making it vegetated as opposed to row crop corn and beans, those kinds of things. So you have a lot of things that are, that are beneficial because of that open space protection including the wildlife part of it, but there's also a big water quality component as it relates to it. And Nipperson Creek, beautiful, a bunch of different habitats that are related to it. And then, you know, the natural areas inventory site, there's a whole bunch concentrated up in northeastern Illinois, including the Hackman Tack area. The, when you're doing a national wildlife refuge, it has to have value. And so when you start putting all this documentation together, that the endangered species, so even though we have the most population in the country, in the state, in Chicagoland, you can see that there's a lot of concentration of endangered listed species in Lake, McHenry, and even Cook counties. So when you start putting all those check boxes together, the Hackman Tack region really you know, hit it pretty good. So Lake County has over 100 listed species in it, although it's obviously fairly populated also. So that's a, a testament to the a lot of the forest preserve and conservation district lands that have done that because they've been able to protect land for these species that are that are endangered. Biodiversity recovery plan, Hackatech fits in perfectly for that. Different things for um, migrating waterfowl habitat, wildlife action plan, all these things were justified the, the creation of the, the Hackmatech influence on climate change, some of these kind of things. So we can buzz through that. But it's also not just for the birds. There are, you know, freshwater mussels, fish, Lanning's turtle, eastern prairie fringed orchid, the tamarack, which the Hackmatack is the Potawatomi Indian name, I believe, for, for tamarack. So that's where the connection of all these. So there's lots of different things. And obviously people, some people in this room. And there's the feasibility study back down in 2010. And then also there's the idea of the, the National Wildlife Refuges bring people in. So it's an ecotourism, bring people to Richmond and to be able to promote the local buying gas and chocolate and those kinds of things. <laughs> but it brings you know people in and that it has, not only is it good for freshwater mussels and birds, it's also good for the local economy because there may not be other, it's not on an interstate corridor or things like that that might drive the economy so that the tax attack would be good for that. So there's the, and you can see where it's at compared to, so you can see that all the National Wildlife Refuges and there's that kind of gap right around Chicago land that's now been filled by Hackmatack, part of the world. <laughs> I didn't have this slide in here. I don't know how Nancy got this put into the program while uh, after I handed the, the thumb drive to Cynthia. But anyway, so 2012, um, you can recognize Dick Durbin, obviously, and Salazar, the Secretary of the Interior at that time. So 561st National Wildlife Refuge, which is pretty cool, I'd say. And then, you know, the refuge-oriented tourism. So bringing in, there's the, um, I'm not sure the name of the trail that goes through Glacial Park, the Rails to Trails Prairie, project goes Prairie, up there. Prairie Trail. Prairie, Prairie Trail. trail. Mm -hmm. so obviously, there's talk about connecting it up to Lake Geneva and, you know, all the way down through other parts of the, of the region. So there's a lot of potential value of Hack the Tech bringing people in and then the ancillary benefits associated with that, obviously. 
Anderson's Candy Shop. So we put that, biking, different things. So we're going to hit a couple things. Um, I don't know, we tried to get an updated version of this, but we have at least 1,400 acres under protection. I think it might be a little bit more over the last six months or so. But you can see that there's the core and corridor habitats as a part of Hackmatack that have been protected through either fee simple purchase or conservation easement. And so the goal over time is going to be over 10,000 acres, but it's a nice, nice ring and all related to the Nipper Sink watershed um, since you know, about 10 years ago. A lot of them were related to the hydric soils or wetland soils of the Nipper Sink area, and then those protected lands that are you know, in Glacier Park down the southeastern corner there and up into Wisconsin, and some of those holdings. So, some of the interesting things is there's an elevation change of over 300 feet in Aquatech. When you think of climate change and resiliency, we've got lands at different levels rather than everything either too high or too low. Um, about 12 miles north to south and 14 miles east to west, so a fairly large chunk. And, uh, and you know, hopefully we can get up to, with the, all the protected lands, you know, over 30,000 acres with of the easements. And then the Nipper Sink Creek watershed as it relates. So just for perspective, Lake Geneva's right here, and then this is Twin Lakes, and then flowing down through, and then Hebron, all coming down to the, all the way through the Fox River, and flowing down to the Mississippi. So that's the Nipper Sink watershed. This, this part of Kenosha County doesn't get into Hackatack quite, but the watershed obviously are related. Uh, one of the interesting things in ecology is the idea of how do you make a national wildlife refuge or a nature preserve? Do you do the sloths concept, a single large, a Yellowstone, or several small? And so there's a lot of discussion on what's what's best for uh, species protection. And Hack Hackmatech does have a combination of both of those because it's going to be ultimately a large refuge with lots of small refuges that make pieces of it, and then for different habitats. So Blanding's turtle habitat and monarch butterfly habitat may not be the same thing, but you need all of them to make it all work properly. So talk about that. Island biogeography, one of those big concepts, um, but it is important when you get on the ground, see how it is, and the different things that are related to that. The large preserves, you know, less edge effects. Certain species need a lot of land. And the monarch butterfly would not be one of those because they don't care about the size of the patch. They just don't care what's in the patch. So, you know, you can be missing out on certain species if you don't have both of those components to it. In the smaller preserve, it's kind of hard to buy 5,000 acres at one time if you don't have the money or the willing sellers. So you essentially, like most places around here, you start small and add the pieces strategically to be able to make smaller pieces and the bigger pieces. Uh, you guys are probably familiar with the big restoration that took place in Nipper Sink Creek years ago. You know, just a fantastic restoration project, taking out all the old drain tiles that, that were in that part of the, the county and that beautiful corridor that they created. But then also, there is a lot of the discussion about monarch butterflies, blending with turtles, but there's also that human component of the open space. So that, you know, there's a lot of research now that are sent into kids and families that live in greener neighborhoods are happier and more well-adjusted, as poofy as that sounds, they found clinically that's true. So there's a lot of discussion in the modern open space is environmental justice and getting inner city kids to have more green. When you look at how many trees are in affluent neighborhoods versus poorer neighborhoods, there's a lot of push to, <coughs> we want to fix our neighborhoods. Green space may be one of those good things to do, which I think Pretty cool from my standpoint. And we worked for a lot of developers over the years. We helped build Dell Web. You may have heard of it, the 45, 4,400 4, units that would be built down there. But one of the things about that open space, they have 250 acres of open space in the middle of it, is that some of those neighborhoods that are have open space as their backyard, they get a premium for those lots. So not only is the open space protection good for Mother Nature, it actually was good for the real estate community. It took them a while to figure that out. <laughs> but once they figured it out and 
how the open space and the trail networks, because modern families love trails, and Lake County Forest Preserves mostly, there's 200, over 200 miles of trails in Lake County. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about people, why do you like your neighborhoods, recreational trails, regional trails are one of the top things, which then raise property values, raise taxes or revenue, which enables you to buy more land, all those things kind of come together. Um, we're getting close to the end, so I don't want to get too, too um, crabby with climate change. However, our climate seems to be changing, and so that influence on our local ecology and humans is a little bit, I'm, we're not exactly sure where it's going, but we know it's going to change. And one of the things that is most obvious is rainfall. So that we're getting more rain, although it dries up faster, and it comes down more intensely. So even, um, and it's not even that the, the weird scientists are saying it, even the engineering and public works community are realizing it. So they actually raised the stormwater values for stormwater detention so that the, the, the engineers and public works guys realize that our weather's changed and actually changed the stormwater ordinances for the state of Illinois to increase the amount of rainfall that has to be dealt with for modern development. So I'm not necessarily, you know, it's not Tom Skilling saying it, it's not these climate scientists, it's actually the engineers and the public works guys are saying rain's different and we need to deal with it differently. So there's a lot of these trends, you know, yeah, spring times are warmer, night times are warmer, all these trends that you guys have probably heard about, but there's a lot of discussion. There's a great study out by the Nature Conservancy on climate influences for Illinois, but the, the extreme precipitation events, you know, we've all seen these four, five, six, seven inch rainstorms, 130 mile hour winds, I mean, crazy stuff that are happening, and it's very likely related to climate change and tide kind of what's coming off the Rocky Mountains from the Pacific Ocean, but then that warmer Gulf of Mexico and how those storms come together, Tornado Alley, those kinds of things, and then the hurricanes. We, we don't get influenced by hurricanes too much here, but that warm Gulf of Mexico is probably driving a lot of what we have here. There's a lot of trends, but one, so you can see that the prediction is that, you know, temperature changes are going to go continue to go up. And so both for summer and springtime, but it's the nightfall, night temperatures that are people are kind of worried about because it's not cooling off as much as it used to, which causes more evapotranspiration too. But so statistics up and down, depending on what statistic you're looking at. Um, Great Lakes, you know, Lake Michigan was record high recently and now it's dropped over a foot and a half in the last year because it hasn't rained very much. So these patterns are interesting. There is an interesting phenomenon in Wisconsin. Many of us have gone to northern Wisconsin. As you drive through the, the southern part of the state, you have prairies and savannas. You get to about Stevens Point, things start to change a little bit. You get north of Wausau, and it's all evergreens. So it's being called the tension zone, which was shown as kind of a wintertime temperatures and, and soil factors and things. That that was kind of the line between northern Wisconsin tension zone and southern Wisconsin and that they're considering if things are the current trends continue that this tension zone at the end of the century most of us won't be around for that <laughs> will be in the Apostle Islands oh. so if you just think about that that everything marches north so now all of a sudden we might have bald cypresses coming into Kankakee and with the vegetation that you see at the Dells today might become prairie. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the, the regional shifts that might that could happen with stuff like that. That's why a lot of people are worried and that we should be doing things to prevent that because we might not be able to catch up, if you will, in the classic sense of just adapting to it because it may be such a such a big change. So hardiness zones, you know, what plants will grow where, those kinds of things. Um, I'm probably talking enough, we could probably keep moving, but um, the resiliency, the factor of the national re refuges that they're big. So they have built-in re uh, resiliency on how much water they can hold and different species and all the things that go with that. And it helps to just make the whole region a little bit more stable because of that protection um, and less pavement and, and the like. So that big world of, that word of resiliency is very 
big nowadays because of places like the city of Chicago, mostly pavement. And so when they get these big storms, there's nowhere for the water to go and there's no way for them to really be resilient. So they had to build the deep tunnel at $25 billion or whatever. It's helping a little bit up to about the 10 year storm and then people's basements still flood. So and that part of that legacy that was started 100 years ago but if you don't plan for resiliency and make your lands be able to adapt to changes like that, it's gonna bite you in the butt eventually. So the Nipissing Creek, beautiful corridor there where the branches come together and then all that stuff. All right, I'll end, I don't think Cindy's here, but this this is for Cindy's group group particularly, <laughs> um, but it's also a connection to my childhood, so. She's on Zoom. Hi, Cindy. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bill Murray, Chicago guy, Saturday Night Live. So in the mid 70s, Lake Erie was dead. Many of you probably remember that. So the depth, you could only see in the Lake Erie about three inches. And it was gross and terrible. Saturday Night Live did a skit called Swill, which was the, oh, yeah. the mineral water from Lake Erie. So it's everything you wanted in a mineral water and more. <laughs> <laughs> And they had a Perrier bottle, essentially, but it had like an Italian dressing in it. Mm. And, it and they played Anticipation by Carly Simon. Oh. And as they're pouring it out, and it's just, just gross, and then the, the old um, soda can pops, the, the pops used to come off, you know, came out of it. So, so Lake Erie was bad enough at that time to be considered dead, an entire Great Lake but also to be made fun of by Saturday Night Live. But the Clean Water Act came in, 1972, 73, Richard Nixon signed the law. So the Clean Water Act came in and they said basically that we've got to fix our waterways, that they're gross and it's important that we have clean water in this country, make everything fishable and swimmable, as the phrase went. But what it did was that it put a lot of money into the system so that you don't have to pay attention to all the numbers, but before 1972, 73, they never really paid attention to where the pollution was coming from, whether it was farm fields or a point source, wastewater treatment plants mostly. So as they started to track it, that then the, the point sources, so the direct point sources, which are wastewater treatment plants from Cleveland, say, Detroit, that, that bar there. And then the rest of this was non-point source, the bluish cerulean colored, mostly farmland. So when you look at the graph through time, this is through 2011 in particular, but you can see the wastewater treatment plant discharges went way down. But when you see that the bar for farmland is still pretty high. So that loadings or the amount of pollution that goes to Lake Erie today isn't all that different from what it was in the 70s from farm fields, but it's been significantly reduced from wastewater treatment plants, all because of public money. And we took out phosphorus from detergents. So the combination of taking out detergent or phosphorus as a conditioning agent in Tide and all the money into the infrastructure of the clean water through the wastewater treatment plants Lake Erie now has a depth that you can see down to 25 feet. Anybody who's been, been fishing there lately, world-class walleye fishery. So in our lifetimes, and since I was a kid, Lake Erie is fully thriving now because of good public policy. So I just, I like to show that just because it's real and it's all within our time frame. So this wasn't a hundred years of time and Mother Nature fixed itself. Once we figured out that we could do that using tax dollars and good policy, we brought back a great lake. I think it's, that's a, a pretty good story, I would say. We still have problems and farm pro, farmland, everyone likes to eat, I realize that, but farm fields are still a problem and they're essentially unregulated when it comes to some of this stuff compared to things like municipalities and wastewater treatment plants, which are fairly highly regulated. But that's not often talked about. So Hack the Tech, we are membership driven. You can find us on the internet. Um, feel free to, to join. 
as a member and uh, we have events that you guys can come out to periodically and um, we have an annual meeting probably in November I believe. we're trying to figure out what the best venue for that will be since Memorial Hall is not available anymore mm -hmm. at least in the short run for us so questions comments be happy to take them or I might have worn you out by this point. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, not this group. No. <laughs> We've got people on Zoom, too. Excellent. So, um, Anne, do you want to um, take go back and forth with in-person and a Zoom question? Sure. Um, we have one in the chat right away. Okay, oh. go ahead. And i got to check my view. I have to check my view on the... If it's from Cindy, um, I'm not going to answer. Stop sharing <laughs> the screen so we can see yes, everybody. Yes, can. And people can... And people can turn on their um, screens if you would like to, your videos. Um, there is a, a question in the chat, and what is the best flower to have near my milkweeds for the adult monarchs from Jim McGrath? Mm -hmm. Let's do it. Uh, I'm not going to say best, but purple cone flower, New England aster, butterfly um, bush is a very good one, depending on the season that you're talking about. but. A lot of those, any of the insect pollinated plants, but especially the ones that have the more like the composites, are probably the best for the for the milkweed or for the monarch. There are a pretty good lists out there on good nectaring plants. Look for that as opposed to uh, more for the caterpillars. Okay. Do we have an in-person question? Anybody? Okay. Can you come okay. forward a little bit so they can hear you? Thank you. And thank um, you again for your help. Yeah, no problem. Um, so my question is, in your research, I don't know if you came across this, did you find any connection between um, avocados and loss of monarch territory in Mexico? No. Okay. No, because I don't, I'm not sure where the avocados are grown. Yeah. I received that question out of the program, so I want to I see if you knew. I don't knew. think so, because um, <laughs> they, when they get to Mexico... Vince, we can't hear you answer. When the, when the monarchs get to Mexico, they're not roaming. Yeah. So if the, if the avocados aren't on their way, they're not going to find them. Right, I guess the, the theory was more that they would be take, going into those OML forests and, and logging them and maybe planting avocados. Oh, I see. I'm not sure about that. Yeah. Well, this, okay, this actually was, uh, if you saw the Guardians, and this was our, our guest speaker, mm -hmm. there was a farmer there who lost uh, a lot of income because he wasn't logging and trying to preserve the forest, was growing avocados. Yeah. Mm. But I we have that at our sense. library if you want to watch okay. it. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. I'll have to look that up and have a better answer. Anything else? Any questions on the Zoom for our Zoom participants? Just put it on, uh, click on the bottom under, um, I think there's a, yeah, under reactions and you can raise your hand. I am not seeing any questions. It's a very thorough presentation. <laughs> <laughs> any more in the room? Perhaps, I have a perhaps verbose. Yes, Mr. Byers. Yeah, Ben, do you think the, it's possible that the Fish and Wildlife Service will lift the, the monarch as a endanger or threatened species in the next three to five years? Doesn't sound like it from what I, yeah. I talked I talk to Louise Clemency yeah. locally and she said they essentially had too much else going on. So that, that time frame is probably a little too short. Unless populations are drastically, you know, if they're continuing to go down, there might be some urgency, but she didn't make it sound too, uh, too urgent on their part because they had too many other things in the queue. Political hot potato food. Yes, political, yeah, especially because it is a habitat generalist. So, like everybody's yard could be habitat. So, when you think about a, even a church, right, you're going to put it in a parking lot expansion, you need permits for it. All of a sudden, you have a potential habitat for a native species, you know, and which is legit, you know, if it was listed. So, it's probably more important for the government to put money into education, probably even money into coordination with the Mexican uh, authorities down there to protect it as opposed to listing it here from a true preservation standpoint. Is that a hand I saw back there? Yes. Um, I would like to ask this to the speakers and um, the 
Okay. I'll try to repeat but, it, Anne. Uh, okay. As far as uh, climate change goes and you know protecting our future, um, how screwed do you think we are? <laughs> and, uh, do you think we have define I love the Great define screw? Love the Great Lakes story. That's great, but like it's you know um, yeah. But, I mean, from your perspective, what do you see? Um, hopeful wise, um, is there is there hope for us to save? Did you hear that? Next, next question, please. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't no, touching that. All right. Okay. Here's my best answer okay, for you. Wait, I have yeah. to repeat the question. How screwed are we? <laughs> <laughs> All right. My, here's my best answer for you. If you live in Miami, <laughs> no. If you live in Chicago, you're screwed. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think if, tre if trends continue and the storms continue like they are, those properties, name other ones, New Jersey, New York City, any of those coastal communities, Louisiana, they're in trouble. And it's, you know, it's partially, in, you know, not just that the oceans are gonna rise, it's the intensity of these storms and they're just gonna be beat on all the time in the current climate with the warming of the waters and all the things that are going on. So those coastal communities are super vulnerable and are already feeling the effect. I saw a newspaper article talking about the Miami's talking about a 20 foot seawall. Whether they ever put that in or be able to afford it, whether it would work, but they're they're there because they're so vulnerable. And the city of Chicago is the same way. You know, you get a seiche coming down Lake Michigan, you got the wind coming and Lakeshore Drive is gonna get in the water. Or, you know, basements will flood and all those other kind of things. If you're living in McHenry County, probably okay. I mean, there's always the flooding on the box and all that stuff, but those big climate change influences, other than like big storms, you know, that, you know, what was it, two, 1995, Naperville got 16 inches of rain or something like that. Those are crazy. And those will cause scattered problems. When you talk about the big, catastrophic, probably unfixable things, the coastal communities would be the worst. No doubt about it. Cool. I don't know if um, online from here, but um, I th this was from the Weather Channel. It didn't even show up on any news article. But we're at 415, and I don't know the measurement. Parts per billion? Um, carbon. Carbon. Carbon right, 415, where, we, you know, Bill McKibben was at 350. That was the whole 350.org. Yeah. And then uh, the notation on that was, it was 65 million years ago that the planet reached that level. And it was when both poles more tropical forests. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, we're doing everything. And of course, there's always at the end, but if we do something now, we'll be fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think from everything that I know, I'm, I'm certainly not a climate scientist, but when you're talking about global coastal communities, there'll be millions of people that will probably be displaced in certain countries. And where are they going to go? You know, and what, what happens with that land? And, agriculture and all the things that come with that on top of and that's that's the drastic damage because of the water and then you've got the central valley in california that played fallow this year because there's not enough water so you have all these mixes of things around here we're in pretty good shape all things considered you know we got good roads and good drainage and all that kind of stuff but a lot of places that don't are they're probably unfixable at this point and if we're over the magic number, how do you reverse that in any real sense when um, it's a, a global issue and most countries don't have enough money, uh, you know, money to feed themselves, mm -hmm. let alone to switch to solar? So. On that note. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, I got a phone one then. Leslie, take it away. There you go. Oh, uh, we have, you know, oh, sorry, we have to make this yeah. a really excellent presentation this evening. Join me, please, in a round of
briefly for some uh, community announcements. So if you have an announcement, if you want to raise your hand, let's, let's start with the ones at Duke's and then go to Zoom. Okay, we have Pat Decock. Come yeah. on up. Yeah, so um, we have a McHenry County chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby. It's an international organization with over 150,000 people. And um, to speak about climate change, uh, that's all we do, is work on climate change issues. And happens to be right now, we're in the midst of pushing our senators to include uh, price on carbon in the infrastructure bill. Now there's all kinds of political things around this, but letting our senators know that we're concerned about climate and want this carbon tax in there. If you've seen anything about companies in our national countries it, uh, throughout the world are working on prices on carbon. Now that's not the total answer. I think we're talking about 40%, uh, but that can be a good shot in the arm to get us through to move on to other part other system. So if you're interested, these are four sheets that you could just take and it only takes less than five minutes to uh, uh, talk to your senator. Okay, well, I mean, you can, it's time, Pat. You can call it's them. It's time. We couldn't, we couldn't <laughs> hear the, <laughs> uh, the alarm as well. You couldn't, uh, you can. You can't hear the timer go up. No. Uh, you can call or email when you book. If you have any questions, let me know. Uh, other members here are Ann Leg and Marty, um, and any other clients? So we can't hear you on Zoom, people. Okay, we're going to be we're going to be louder. Another community announcement, Marty, and then Nancy. So we're going to be and come. Okay, you need to come closer to yeah. the computer, Marty. Come talk to my laptop. Hi, Ann. Okay, yeah, talk to the laptop. I will talk to the laptop. Hi, I'm Marty Gorman. I'm representing the Food Shed Food Co-op, which is the grocery store that we are building on Route 14 and Lakeshore Drive. I have many, many owners here present tonight. Yay. The website says 1,153 as of tonight. Yay. Woohoo. Um, we're having a launch party on August 15th, which is a Sunday. It will be at MCC from two to five, and we'll be talking about our community investment campaign, which is the beginning of the funding to get those doors open. Everybody's invited, whether you are an owner or you just want to find out about the food shed. I've got little sheets on the back there. Please take one home with you to remind yourself, put it on the calendar. Two to five, we're going to have the mayors of Woodstock there, the mayor of Crystal Lake. Uh, Dr. Gabbard from MCC will be speaking along with all the board members and all your questions will be answered and there'll be treats. Okay, thank you. Good job. Okay. Nancy. You can get closer, do not be afraid. Yes. Hello, Zoomites. Um, <laughs> I want to invite everybody to come to the Monarch Family Fair at Crystal Lake Main Beach on August 15th. Figure you're going to wear your masks. We don't know what the rules are going to be, but we're going to have inside the Crystal Lake Pavilion. We're going to have at least 15 organizations, including U.S. Fish and Wildlife, the climate people. Uh, we're going to have MCCD, um, all sorts of people that can explain to you how to make your yard more viable for our pollinators and our monarchs. And also, there's lots of things for little kids to do. We're going to move people fast through this year. Uh, it's from 12.30 to 4 o'clock, so, and the beach is free. Crystal Lake Park District is all bought into it. It's our seventh year, and the beach is free for that day, and there'll also be community bands playing, so it's a great day, August 15th, so please come. Okay. Perfect. Okay, Carolyn Campbell with um, McHenry Hi, Hi. Um, McHenry County <laughs> Conservation District. Yes. Um, on August 14th, next day, um, at Felpro Conservation um, Site on, in Cary, I forget what street that's on, it's from 11 to 2, and it's going to be uh, celebrating our 50th anniversary for this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you go online to uh, the district's website, they apparently, have, I did not see this before, they have a lot to do, they have a card, if you, uh, if you uh, print it out, 
It's very family uh, oriented. There's different activities, and if you get you go to each activity, you get it marked, and if you fill the card, you get a prize at the end of the day. Um, so that's 11 to 2. Um, the, uh, that was my minute for that, okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll start, we'll start a new minute. New minute. Okay, so the Fox River Ecosystem Partnership is in host with the Defenders is hosting uh, a habitat as um, roadside as habitat, and I may be taking this away from somebody, but uh, that is going to be next Wednesday, August 11th, from noon to one. It will be on Richmond Road. I don't know, that must be available on the Defenders website. It's also available at the Fox River Ecosystem.org website, um, and that's gonna be showing how they're using roadsides for uh, pollinator plants. So ev everyone is welcome to that as well. So, and that's it. Thank you. And if you're a defenders, if you're a defenders member, that went out to you.